Hello and welcome to Non-Breaking Space, which you can find online at nonbreakingspace.tv. Non-Breaking Space is a show where we'll seek out the best, brightest, and smartest people on the web and talk to them about how and why they do what they do. Your hosts are Christopher Schmidt and Dave McFarlane, two web designers, authors, and trainers who have a passion for sharing knowledge about the web. I'm Chris from Canada, a web designer and podcaster Christopher and Dave have invited along to help push the record button and keep everyone on track here on Non-Breaking Space. Our guest for this episode is Lou Rosenfeld. Lou is an independent information architecture consultant and founder and publisher of Rosenfeld Media, a publishing house focusing on user experience books. He has been instrumental in helping establish the fields of information architecture and user experience, and in articulating the role and value of librarianship within these fields. So without further ado, I'll turn it over to Christopher and Dave and their conversation with Lou. So Dave, how's it going? Oh, hi, Christopher. It's going well. How are you doing? I'm doing all right. I'm doing okay. Um, hang and what's there. new? Uh, well, we just launched uh, our our new conference called the uh, In Control Conference uh, 2012 uh, Honolulu. Uh, so we're actually going to Hawaii at the end of the year. Yes. Uh, so yes. And, uh, <laughs> so uh, and uh, and you're going to be coming with us because you're yeah, I'm speakers. so excited. Yeah, <laughs> it's going to be great. Yeah. So we just so we're waiting for. Um, yeah, so we just announced it, and then also, so it's uh, in controls is a two day track. We also do workshops before the conference proper, but we're also doing something different uh, this year. We're actually adding another day, but it's a whole different conference, and it's, that's the CSS DevConf, and so that's it's going to be a whole uh, conference that's dedicated to uh, multi track sessions about CSS mobile, uh, where JavaScript intersects with CSS and some of that. So it's going to be a really great time in uh, in Hawaii. At the end awesome. Of the year. So, yeah. Sounds great. Yeah, and then, um, but yeah, but I'm really stoked uh, to talk to our, our guest for today, and uh, um, something that's you know uh, really big, especially with the mobile space, and but also with the whole industry uh, proper, like the whole web design industry is like uh, information architecture and uh, user experience. So yeah, so let's uh, so let's, let's bring up our, our guest and uh, hey Lou, hey guys, uh, hey hi, hey, how, how are you? I'm doing great. How are you doing? I'm oh, um, I'm hot in Brooklyn. Hot, hot in Brooklyn, Brooklyn. hundred degrees. Jeez. Yep. <laughs> maybe only uh, 80. maybe you can only invite 80 me to here. Honolulu. Do you want me to scout your uh, your Honolulu venue? <laughs> <laughs> happy to. Oh man, send me a ticket. Uh, there's actually the hotel has a webcam, and we've been uh, checking it out every day. So it's been like not as good as scouting in person. I will grant you, but uh, it's like the best we can do. Another job lost to automation. Yes. <laughs> oh well. Yeah. So um, maybe we we'll just start with giving a little bit of history about yourself for people who are listening and don't uh, know who you are, what you do. So maybe you could just tell us, you know, where you started, where you are now. Um. Okay. Um, well, I, if people know me for anything, it's being one of the uh, the, the authors with Peter Morville of uh, the O'Reilly book, Information Architecture for the World Wide Web. And uh, that's uh, uh, often known as the polar bear book. We got very lucky when it came to choosing animals. It wasn't yeah. the ban- I'm glad it wasn't the banana slug book. <laughs> <laughs> but um, uh, that um, you know, kind of leading up to that, uh, that book, which originally came out in 98 and the third edition came out in uh, 2006, um, I had um, come from a library science background and... Uh, I uh, was a, a, a grad student in that area in the late 80s, early 90s, um, uh, taught courses at the University of Michigan on designing information for the Internet way back in like 93, 94, uh, and uh, had started a consulting firm that, that Peter Morville actually was my partner in uh, called Argus Associates. And all we did was information architecture consulting and did that for about a decade, ran that company, Peter, and uh, have uh, in the, the 10, 12 years uh, since uh, been a, a solo uh, consultant working with uh, mostly Fortune 500s and other large dysfunctional organizations that uh, are really suffering big information headaches. So I'm kind of a, I've become more of a, less of an information architect and, and more of, a, of an information therapist. And uh, <laughs> I've also in the last uh, few years become more and more involved in uh, not just IA, but uh, user experience as, it, as it's matured. And um, uh, I felt that there was a need for a publishing house that was really dedicated to uh, publishing in that space. Uh, there's certainly a lot of great books out there, but from publishers that were really just sort of dipping their toe in 
And uh, I, I kind of jumped in with both feet and started Rosenfeld Media, which uh, just published its 10th book, uh, Rachel Hinman's uh, The Mobile Frontier, which I think is probably germane to some of the topics you were bringing up earlier. And um, we have about 15, 17 books in the pipeline. Uh, all of a sudden, our authors are finishing uh, all at once. <laughs> seems to be all at once after a few years of being in the wilderness. Yeah. Um, and we're about to actually launch uh, some new things in terms of not just books, but really we're becoming a user experience expertise company. Mm. So books are one form of expertise. We, we also have a six-city a year um, uh, workshop tour. Uh, we have some of the really good people in the field, our authors, but others as well, um, teaching full-day workshops. We're going to be in Minneapolis, Toronto, and New York in the fall. And uh, we're also about to launch um, uh, both an in-house uh, user experience uh, training course catalog with about 30 full-day courses and about 30, 35 experts who not only teach those courses but are available for very high-end uh, consulting, teach Amanda Fish consulting. And so um, that's kind of the business I'm in. Uh, it, it, it's um, kind of marrying the consulting work that I used to do and I've been doing it solo with the expertise of this great network of UX people that I get to work with in, in new ways. Um, so I, I feel like I've sort of dipped into not about me, but about my company, and I, I don't want it to become an advertisement. So uh, I'll, I'll stop now, and you guys can take it in another direction. So you started Argus Associates in 91, right? Yes, correct. And yeah. that, that was just a year after Tim Berners-Lee created the World Wide Web. So, so what were you working on in 91? Well, it's funny you mention that, because... Um, I was working on uh, the internet uh, pre-web when we were doing gopher sites. Oh, even before oh that. man. Are you Remember serious? that? Yeah. Are you serious? Um, yeah. Oh, go, oh <laughs> man. I, I used to have the, uh, the, the GopherCon 2 t-shirt, uh, and I, I, I gave it away as part of a raffle, and that was probably one of the stupidest things I've ever done. But um, uh, I was actually working um, in libraries on... Um, some interesting systems, uh, both um, doing things like helping uh, some of the folks there get census uh, files up into FTP servers and kind of more interesting things like um, creating uh, filtering systems uh, for Usenet postings. Remember Usenet? Mm -hmm. oh, so yeah. we, uh -huh. we develop, design profiles for people and then filter all, out all kinds of Usenet postings for them. So kind of some interesting stuff back then. And, and um, one of the things I, I, I was really uh, involved with is I started um, teaching uh, students how to go out and become subject matter experts in various um, uh, topics of internet content. So um, their projects were to, for example, create the guide to theater resources on mm -hmm. the internet or uh, personal finance resources or whatever. And remember, this is like just when the in fact, we, well, before the web really got going, mm -hmm. and um, there wasn't that much to track down, but it was already getting out of hand for each of these topics. And so they would pull together what they learned as their major course uh, assignment, and then I would publish them in what was initially a, a gopher site and became a website when the web hit. And we would pull together not only our students' guides to all these various subject areas, um, but others as well. And it became this broad clearinghouse that was sort of Yahoo-ish, but not in the right part of the country to get attention. Hmm. <laughs> we, this was in Ann Arbor, Michigan. Uh -huh. uh, and um, I remember you, you, you mentioned Tim Berners-Lee, and I, I got a, I wish I'd saved it. I got a kind of a testy email from Tim around that time. He said, well, I'm already doing the World Wide Web Virtual Library and you shouldn't really be doing this. And I'd already been doing it. <laughs> um, but, uh, you know, we were all doing things that were highly unscalable uh, mm -hmm. without people, which is what, you know, Jerry and David at Yahoo figured out is how to get the money to pay for the people and then leverage that for more things. Right. But um, I actually wrote a, an article, I think in 94, called The Untimely Death of Yahoo. And it was basically about how search was going to be far more important than directories in terms of mm -hmm. getting people around the Internet. And um, Yahoo didn't die. I mean, I guess it's sort of a zombie these days. Um, but um, I think it was prescient in the sense that Google really kind of took, um, took away uh, that, that mind space and, yeah. and, and became what it became.
Yeah, absolutely. So what was the first website that you worked on as a consultant or that Argus Associates worked on? You know, we, we worked on a, a, a couple at, at the University of Michigan that were not especially interesting looking back on it. But, you know, uh, you know if, if any, anyone who does consulting can appreciate this, is always that early, maybe not your first, but one of your first big, big, uh, exciting consulting projects with a really cool client that you never forget. And it's like a first love. Mm-hmm. And like almost every first love, it ends up, you know, crushing your heart and stomping all over. <laughs> and that was Borders. So uh-huh. um, uh, my company, Argus, and, and a few other companies had a consortium, and I was essentially the, the lead for bringing in Borders, which was uh, our hometown uh, company in Ann Arbor. And we had a contract with Borders to build not only their first website, which we did, um, but their first uh, online bookstore. Uh, and this was before Amazon had launched. Wow. And we actually came up with, I thought, a pretty amazing plan to do that uh, based largely on porting some of the really, really smart things that Borders people had pioneered in terms of merchandising and so forth and, and porting that over to a website and building on top of um, their, their amazing distribution uh, and fulfillment system. Uh, you've got to keep in mind that you know, even though Borders is no more at that time, which was not so long ago, they were opening a new superstore every three days. Oh, yeah. Unfortunately, um, this is where the heart gets crushed. Um, they decided that um, the Internet wasn't really you know, that interesting to them. Uh-huh. <laughs> it's far better to continue taking on huge long-term leases and, and big box uh, store spaces and strip malls. Uh, which is ultimately, one of the two things that killed the company, the other thing being that they never really could do business on the Internet. Right. So, uh, Amazon launched. <laughs> You know the story, and eventually Borders became a tab at Amazon, and right. now Borders is no more. So it could have been amazing, but uh, yeah, it wasn't meant to be. Yeah, then didn't Borders like go back and try to reclaim their space after yeah. Amazon? And so I was just okay. Yeah, the progression was we worked with them, we gave up. Um, they ended up doing what what they were comfortable with, which was hiring IBM. And you never got fired for hiring IBM, but you might go out of business in the process. <laughs> and, um, <laughs> And then um, that didn't work, and they, after a few million dollars of, of you know, that going nowhere, uh, they became a tab, and then way too late, they right. uh, tried to pull it back, uh, right. but uh, it was way too late. Yeah. yeah. So Argus Associates was pretty much the first information architecture firm. In fact, I think it was the only one, right, for a long time. Um, now your emphasis seems to be on uh, user experience. That's what uh, Rosenfeld Media, uh, the books that you publish, um, mm-hmm. are about. Maybe you could sp- explain for people who are kind of don't understand the subtleties of the differences between these two. What's information architecture? What's user experience? Where do they overlap, and how are they different? Oh God! Um, you, you're, <laughs> in a way, you're you're asking me to not um, participate in but one but two religious wars uh, <laughs> at the same time. Uh, around um, uh, the DTDTs, which is defining the damn thing. But I'll, here, I'll, here I go. Thanks a okay. lot, guys. Um, uh, I, I would suggest that uh, uh, information architecture is basically a, a series of practices around making information more findable. Um, we do that by working on uh, approaches to organizing it, structuring it, labeling it, and making search work well. And um, so it's basically, you know, let's, let's do a kind of design around uh, findability, specifically navigation and uh, search, and making those things work together. Mm-hmm. User experience, on the, on the other hand, I would not say is a field or a discipline or uh, a practice. Um, in, in many respects, it's best described as a, as a shared state of consciousness or state of mind that, that people from different design disciplines have. Um, when they are working on really big, challenging projects for which one set of design tools or perspectives is insufficient. Mm. So um, when you put together interaction designers and information architects and usability testing people and content strategists and, and visual designers and on and on and on, and you put them together, um, they need to have something in common so they can actually work together and the commonality are, um, is what we call UX. It's, it's to some degree the consciousness that, or realization that they need to work together. 
Uh, it's partially the fact that they need to have common vocabulary so they can actually have a conversation that's constructive and productive. Uh, and it's, it's partly the, the recognition that they're, they just can't do it on their own. You don't want to, um, you know, you, um, well, look, imagine if, um, pick your favorite application, website, or other service, imagine it was just designed by usability people or just designed by visual designers mm-hmm. or just designed by information architects and how bad it would be. Mm-hmm. The really successful stuff is, is cohesent, co- coherent and cohesive because it was designed by people who had goals of cohesiveness and coherence. And, and to me, that's, those are user, user experience people, regardless of where they originally come from. So is, you, you were saying IA, information architecture, is kind of a discipline, but UX is not necessarily a yeah. discipline? Is that yeah. what you're saying? UX is not a discipline. It's, a, it's, a, it's people from different disciplines that are pulling those ideas, those tools, those practices together and making them work together. Mm-hmm. So you can't say that this is how UX is done. Because mm-hmm. how it's done in the context of developing an app uh, uh, for the mobile context may be very different than how it's done when you are um, developing and or designing an intranet for a, a Fortune 50 or when you're designing Disneyland. Those are mm-hmm. all very different contexts in which user experience plays a big role. But the tools, the practices, the perspectives that you would use in each of those situations could be radically different. The consciousness, the understanding that this is an interdisciplinary uh, work is the Mm -hmm. same, but which disciplines and which tools come to play in each of those projects could be quite different. So let's say uh, you're on a web team with a bunch of designers and information architects and other people, and somebody new joins your team, and they don't know what UX is. And you say, you need to join our consciousness of UX. And how would you explain it to them? How would you bring them up to speed? What would you do to say, this is how we need to think uh, to be user experience-oriented you know, web designers? That's a tough one, and, and sometimes the easiest way is to not explain, but to, to show or to use kind of concrete analogies or demonstrations. So, you know, for example, this is like a, a, a stupid example, but I would say, you, you know how you love Apple, um, the experience that Apple gives you? Well, let's do a little math. Apple uh, minus user experience equals Sony. <laughs> uh-huh. That's, that's uh, unfair and stupid, but it, it kind of makes a certain point that there's a certain consciousness that people at Apple have about how they approach design that's different than the sort of disjointed uh, series of, of products and services that a company like Sony produces. What you want to do is to get that person to then ask, well, what is the difference? And then you can, that sets them up to have a conversation about how there are um, different kinds of tools that come from different disciplines that, that come to play in, in each setting. And, you know, you might say, you know, let, let's think about what you bring. Now, let's think about what's not on that list. Mm-hmm. Uh, you, you might be an interaction designer. Let's, do you know anything about metadata? Do you know anything about uh, ethnography? Do you know anything about yada yada? Well, here's what those things are and how they work with what you do. So, um, yeah, but you know, in a way, that's not a fair question because it, it's it sort of depends on whom you're bringing on to your team. If you're bringing mm-hmm. on someone who's, you know, my age, uh, late forties, it's a very different conversation that you'd have with them than bringing on someone who's in their early twenties, mm-hmm. who's grown up with good user experience, and maybe more importantly, um, a kind of mind that is already either good at or ready to do synthesis in a way that old farts like me aren't. So let let me explain what I mean. People like me in my generation, um, when when we got our academic training, uh, when we were sort of, uh, uh, you know, inoculated with the the germs of our disciplines, we we were, you know, in, in kind of siloed grad schools and other programs where we weren't really necessarily encouraged to, to look outside our field. Right. And we were told to read certain journals and magazines and go to certain conferences and hang out with people like us. Right. And, um, and, you know, com- contrast that with the, the, the people, I think, who are coming into the field now. And by the field, I mean the industry of design and development. They are natural uh, synthesizers. I don't think they have those disciplinary blinders on in quite the same way. They, they are pretty comfortable going 
to conferences that other uh, disciplines might put on because they look interesting. They're, they're not mm-hmm. blindly allied to the professional association that they joined at college. In fact, they often don't bother with professional associations. The sort of sense of identity they have is looser mm-hmm. and more flexible and therefore more open to synthesis. Mm-hmm. So like, I always like to, not that he's that young anymore, but I always feel like he's, he's kind of young uh, and a wonder, wonder kind. Uh, Luke Rabluski is uh, one of my one of our authors, and um, he, he's someone who uh, you know has like this visual design background, but can can code and you know does some great research that draws on um, a lot of usability uh, engineering principles and, and on and on. And I don't think he really you know cares. He just he just looks at mm-hmm. like what, what is it going to take to mm-hmm. solve problems? Right. Yeah. So so in, in the essence, it's like um, uh, just. Uh, going to other conferences, like you like you mentioned, is just uh, just learning new uh, tools and new techniques from other from other industries, and then bringing that into like the next client problem that you have to solve, or whether it's your your your, your internal problem that you have to solve, or, or for for a client. So it's just you know this continuing learning process. So it's not like uh, this one set of uh, tools for solving a problem uh, that you learn in college. It's just is a whole unique field out there that you have to bring. Well, right, and, and, and just think about how all these technologies have opened up these incredible opportunities to innovate. So if you're in a, an established field where there's not much change, um, what starts to happen, and I think this has happened in a lot of engineering um, areas, where you're, you, you end up not necessarily looking to innovate, but you end up looking for efficiencies. Mm-hmm. So it, let's say you're in the automotive industry, you, you, you don't really innovate. You're, you're really, you're, your job for your whole career might be figuring out ways to shave a penny or two out of the, the um, you know, the, whatever the, the adhesive that's binding the you know, inside of the car door to the outside and, and how to you know, push that, that efficiency down, down, down to your suppliers and to their suppliers and their suppliers. And you know, so there's not like, you know, a whole lot of sort of interesting innova- innovation that, that has gone on in, in industries like that for the most part. And we get to do all this innovative stuff, but we, how can you, it, it's because it's such a, a frontier and, and it, there's so many unknowns, you, you get hungry for knowledge wherever you can find it. And you'll, you'll look outside, you have no choice but to look outside your comfort zone and, and you know, uh, the, the 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 publications you might have been familiar with while you were a student and go far beyond them. You have no choice. To, uh, you're not going to succeed in any other way other than to be hungry for knowledge wherever you might find it. So uh, where where outside of the normal you know uh, areas that like say web designers, developers, uh, you know content experts they, that that we normally look at these set of sites, maybe where we're getting our knowledge from, what other disciplines would you recommend people looking at to sort of enhance their, their, uh, their worth in terms of their, what they can do at the job and what, you know, uh, they can bring to new projects. I think you'd mentioned ethnography, which of course comes from anthropology. Are there other disciplines that you think are untapped maybe? Uh, yeah. Yeah, I, I do. I, I uh, and it's not just because I'm I'm married to one, and uh, <laughs> uh, but I well a former one. Um, I think journalism mm-hmm. is yeah. going to be really critical. Uh, it not only are there just an unbelievably smart, skilled bunch of people wondering what the hell to do with their lives out there right now because that whole business model has collapsed and and hasn't reassembled itself into something new yet. But um, I, I I just think you know. There's so many great communication skills, but that's what journalism is to a large degree is communication. And I think a lot of us, as smart as we are, as innovative as we are, as, as you know, uh, aggressive as we are at, at chasing down new ideas and, and new tools, we're pretty bad communicators ultimately. And it's sort of shocking to me that in a, in a field where we're basically in many cases trying to to uh, lubricate communications, dialogue, engagement between organizations and, and customers or users, that we're not very good communicators. And uh, I, I think the content strategy movement, if you will, has, has risen partly in response to that. Um, and I, I think 
they've only kind of, you know, scratched the surface there. I, I think there's a lot more to do there. I think there are going to be kind of um, uh, new roles of uh, communications that are, are based not on sort of the typical Marcom model of, of sort of one-to-many blast out a monologue mm-hmm. and will people take notice. I, I think it's going to be very much centered on, on dialogue and engagement. And that's ultimately what we're all about anyway. But I don't think we've really, we, we kind of either take it for granted or, or it just hasn't really sunk in yet that that's a role that needs curation more than, than it has uh, been given so far. And I think the journalists are going to be the people we, we turn to to help us there. Mm-hmm. Well, it's almost like with you know with the whole World Wide Web, like everyone has their own printing press, right? So, everyone, I think there's you could say you know, maybe we could say that uh, we're all getting used to the fact that we all have this publication uh, powerhouse, you know, this tool at our fingertips that we didn't have before. We're all trying to get used to to be better communicators. Um, that was just you know just in the domain of you know uh, big publishers like you know newspaper publishers and and right. magazines. So. So again, that um, you brought up cut and strategy, and um, I, I do want to ask a question about cut and strategy. Uh, we had actually had a Christina Halverson on a previous episode, and of uh, of not, not bringing it to space show, and she actually mentioned that she, um, you know, cut and strategy is, is a new, I guess, discipline, if you will. And she actually talked to you about kind of. And she, she mentioned that she talked to you about. Uh, what tips uh, and um, your history with bringing IA. Uh, industry uh, and to you know just to bring it out um, uh, like what would you I think she said like what would you do differently now mm-hmm. like things like and I was going to just ask you like you know like what type of things would you do have done differently um, like if we could go back in a, t- in a time machine and, and try to start things out and, and what things did, did you did you do that you think are turned out great um, you know so I was really fortunate to to be involved in the founding of, of two of the institutions in, in IA. One is the Information Architecture Summit, which we, I think, just had our 13th or 14th. Wow. And uh, it's had its ups and downs, but it's, uh, it's going really strong. Uh, and the other thing is the Information Architecture Institute, which is the, um, essentially the professional association for the field, which, you know, is doing okay. Um, and what I'm really happy about is, in both cases, you know, I, I was there sort of to, to help um, midwife the, the, the birth, but um, there's a really good people there to, to raise the kids. And, you know, I think we've all been pretty good, maybe almost too good, about, you know, just sort of letting people, letting other people do stuff. I, there's, there's like a, a kind of market lack of um, megalomaniacal behavior in our field. And, and I think that's good, although once in a while, you know, we might need a little bit of, of sort of forceful, uh, benevolent dictatorship. I'm certainly not that person, but um, sometimes I feel like we're a little bit adrift. Um, I don't know. You know, I, I guess I'm, I'm, I'm a bit torn, as, as you can tell. Um, uh, you know, I think it's good that people have been willing to share and step aside and, and, and let other people uh, take the lead. If I felt like there was a mistake, um, I, I feel like we grappled with what the IAI was going to be from the very start, with, and there were a lot of models, but nothing was obvious, and so we, we've kind of fallen to a, a default model of a professional association, mm-hmm. and um, I got in a, in a little, uh, uh, I got a little attention recently um, because I, I responded um, you may have seen to a, a, a letter from the, the board of the new UXPA, mm-hmm. which was the UPA, and they've, they've rebranded themselves. And, um, you know, I had some issues with, with what they were doing and, and how they were doing it. But I think the thing that really bugs me about what they were doing most of all and what kind of I, I, fear, I fear with the IAI, the Information Architecture Institute, is this reliance on a business model that is broken. It's a, a, an old business model that hasn't really kept up with all kinds of new things. Professional associations, you know, they were great if you needed to get group health insurance and mm-hmm. great if, um, you know, they were going to put on an annual event. And, and, and maybe that's what they should just do is just sort of support those kind of basic things. But we've, we've kind of turned to, the, to them to do more. And they're not really good 
at doing more. Mm-hmm. They're very much based on this concept of membership. Right. And membership is a form of consumption. It's not engaging. It's more, I paid my 40 bucks. Now, what are you going to give me? Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. Uh, it's not really good at uh, acknowledging that there are many different levels and forms of engagement that people in a community or in a discipline can, can take and should take and maybe even create paths to, to moving from one level of engagement to the next higher level of engagement. So, uh, you know, I'm, I'm kind of frustrated in that not only in the IA field, but in other fields in UX that we, we, you know, we have these professional associations, we turn to them, the people who run them have great intentions, are good people and work their asses off, but ultimately a professional association is just like any other tool and when you've got a hammer, every problem looks like a nail. So I I don't know what should replace it, but I I can't see relying on professional associations to do very much for any community. And um, I'm I'm mad at myself for not having a a better model. I I don't know. I have some ideas, but meanwhile, I feel like we're stuck in the late 20th century in terms of how we organize organize ourselves professionally. And maybe we just have to have that kind of generational die-off and and, you know, the Luke Rabluski generation take over and it'll <laughs> all be all nifty and, and all worked out. Yeah, it is, it is kind of interesting how, like, um, when we started out um, with, with web, you know, from, I'm from a web designer you know, background, it's like everyone was a generalist and then we've grown into specialists. And then, like, a Luke is more of a, uh, I guess, a journalist, but, you know, but, you know, he's, he does the coding, he does design, he does the researching and so that. So he's able to pull everything together and then, in a more typical journalist, and so it's kind of kind of weird to have that, kind of like this approach, like cyclical approach, like we're going from journalist to specialist to to, uh, to that, and, and maybe it's not a cyclical at all, but maybe just people feel better being um, defined as you know doing their specialty and being okay with that. So, I guess that's you, you, I think you really hit on something, which is and it's just a personality trait. A lot of us really do need the comfort of the, of boundaries. Um. I don't know. I still think you can have your cake and eat it too. Even if you're someone who needs boundaries, once they're in place, well, then you have the occasional boundaries to violate, mm. right? Mm-hmm. To get out of, to get out of that box. All right. Um, but I also feel like, in general, we have to be more willing to operate without boundaries, without defined paths, and so forth. Because if if we're if that's what we need, we are uh, at least as individuals absolutely screwing ourselves professionally. Right. That's mm-hmm. how you find yourself in a dead end situation and without any idea of how to get out of it. Right. Right. Well, and I think that's one thing that's different about our industry than other industries um, where there are successful professional associations is that everything is just always churning. The technology is churning. The uh, capabilities are churning. Uh, uh, The way we are now interacting with information and with each other. uh, I mean, it's changing weekly, not, not every 15 or 20 years, but all of the time. And so it's hard to sort of put on, put those boundaries in place because they just break apart. So a lot of professional organizations in other fields, you know, they come up with a, a set of standard practices or a way of getting accredited for Mm -hmm. being in that field. And we just can't do that because you can't, you, you know, you're accredited this year. It doesn't work next year because everything has changed again. I, I completely agree with you. And, and, um, you know, I, I kind of feel that basically when we're talking about communities, uh, we're, we're, ba- we're really talking about infrastructure. It, it's, the communities are, are pretty much there. They just have certain needs, and those needs are served by certain chunks of infrastructure. And by infrastructure, I'm defining that really broadly. It could be a professional group. It could be a local event. It could be, a, a face, it could be Facebook. Uh, you know, th- so there's lots of types of infrastructure that we need at different times, and the infrastructure itself is always changing. And when we define business models with assumptions that infrastructure doesn't change, that's when we get in trouble. So uh, you know, just to talk, get back to you know, business models, uh, with Rosenfeld Media, for example, I've tried to, to define our business model is just enough infrastructure to help people develop their really good ideas and get it out to, to, to a broader uh, group. So I, I see us trying to kind of nimbly straddle uh, the middle ground between, on one end of the, uh, the spectrum, traditional publishing, which is another broken, maybe 19th century business model, totally screwed up. And then the other end of the spectrum, 
self-publishing, which is fraught with all kinds of other problems, as anyone who's actually <laughs> waded into those right. waters has discovered. And, um, you know, neither one of those is perfect. And I'm not saying the middle ground is perfect, but I think there's a lot of value in providing infrastructure without um, letting that infrastructure get dragged down by uh, a legacy of, doing, of, of how to do things. And that's hard, but that's mm -hmm. fun. That's really fun. And hopefully it'll work. We'll see. <laughs> yeah. Well, I mean, anyone who's in this field has to be prepared to, you know, innovate professionally all the time. I mean, mm -hmm. you can't learn a set of practices for information architecture and expect that that's not going to evolve uh, on a yearly basis. Um, and especially true with user experience, where we're bringing in all these different disciplines, where we are experiencing, uh, you know, rapid innovation in uh, like social media and these other ways that we are now taking in web content and and uh, changing web content. Um, so it's it's I mean it's a great field. It's an awesome field, but you have to be agile. You have to be willing to innovate yourself um, to innovate the field. Amen. And and you know that's uh, you, you know couldn't be put any better than that. You have to be nimble. You have to be agile. That's who you are if you're going to be a, a successful in this field, at least for more than a couple months. Yeah, yeah, absolutely. So um, you established, you know, uh, you and Peter and, you know, other people established information architecture as a discipline that really didn't exist um, um, before. Are there other disciplines that you see that are now evolving that you really think may become um, a, a, a discipline as almost a requirement for web development in the future? I mean, content strategy is, is one that it seems to be moving along, uh, kind of establishing its boundaries, what it, it, it's about and what its goals are. Do you, do you see other uh, I'll just jump back and say, uh, you know, I, I mean, uh, uh, as much as I'd like to take a lot of credit for IA. It had a history before sure. we got involved, and yeah. um, I, I like to think we helped really grow it, but uh, I just want to be clear about that. Um, but as far as looking forward uh, to new fields, one of the interesting things I'm seeing, and I don't know how much this sort of plays on or touches on web development, but um, I, I think it's something a lot of us who are doing some form of design or, or development are, are going to encounter if we haven't already which is there's a certain migration along a, a career path to things like uh, product management. Mm -hmm. uh, and um, if you're in, inside an organization uh, or if you're outside an organization and let's say you're doing consulting, it, it becomes almost management consulting. So those are some interesting new skills and perspectives that make a lot of sense, not only just in terms of how our careers progress, but think about the kind of work we do. We're ultimately mm -hmm. responsible, many of us, if, in one way or another, for products. Right. And a lot of these products are purely digital, they're very information-based, mm -hmm. and they're experience-based. So we're natural people to fill that mm -hmm. vacuum. Now, if you are you know, in a more traditional setting, and let's say you're a, a senior decision maker in a large organization, and you're thinking about things like management consulting and, and product uh, management, you're not necessarily ever going to think to look to the world of user experience or the broader world of web development for those people. Mm -hmm. So there's an interesting disconnect there. Uh, and, you know, we're going to, if we're not already, I think a lot of us are going to find ourselves competing, maybe successfully with the McKinsey's out there. Mm -hmm. I, I think it's going to be a pretty fascinating contrast uh, between the kind of perspective that we take in consulting and product development and, and management to the kind of traditional approaches that, that those types of folks take. And yeah. uh, I kind of, I, I don't know if it's going to be a, if we're all going to just sort of come together and they're going to hire a bunch of us and <laughs> we'll, or we're going to have some sort of interesting showdown in the next few years. Uh, I guess we'll have to wait and see. So right. what, what would you define uh, product management or and management consulting like? Like, what do you mean when you, when you say those words? So a lot of us um, go from being responsible for a product's experience to being responsible for the product. It's, it's, it, it becomes a natural perspective or a natural evolutionary path in terms of, uh, you know, 
hey, you know, you might start your own product. Like, for example, I think of Rashmi Sina. She and her husband started SlideShare. I remember hanging out with her at the, uh, in all the information architecture summits, and, and they just got bought by uh, LinkedIn for a lot of money. Mm-hmm. And it's a purely information-based product. Mm-hmm. And so it's a natural thing for someone like that to do. So she became essentially a, a product uh, mm-hmm. manager slash owner slash entrepreneur. Mm-hmm. Um, that's an extreme case, but within... Uh, other settings, there are a lot of us that are, are, you know, maybe working for a company where we own a product, and um, they, uh, we, we, it's not just design and experience and testing and Q and A, but it becomes things like you know understanding uh, P and Ls and understanding how to manage a team, mm-hmm. and so those are skills that we may not be good at, but we're by whether we like it or not, learning that we have to be good at. And getting those skills on the job in many cases. Now, uh, on the outside, you know, I, I kind of find myself in a position where I'm doing management consulting. Uh, again, I don't have an MBA. Uh, I come from library science. You, you could not have ever convinced me I would be <laughs> advising large organizations on what I think are pretty strategic issues. Um, but think about it. When you're, when you're, let's say, involved with a public website, That is becoming, if not already, for so many major organizations, the main interface with the world outside the organization. What is more strategic than that? And so um, I get brought in uh, to help with, you know, information architecture related issues. And, you know, you find that things like IA are the tail that wags the dog. It's like, well, we're talking about things like IA, but really we're talking about the organization strategy as as sort of um, uh, instantiated through things like design and IA. Mm-hmm. Yeah, and a lot of organizations don't realize that. It's kind of eye-opening for them when they suddenly realize that, wow, you know, actually the design is, is our bread and butter. The design is what is going to distinguish us and help us succeed in the marketplace. And that's what's happening. And that's exciting. And that's why you know, I never, ever, ever worry about the health of this profession. Mm-hmm. I think I think we're we're basically the the future of the economy for much of the world, at least the post industrial world. Not, not not that I'm you know prone to exaggeration, <laughs> <laughs> but I don't think it's that far off to say that, yeah, yeah. if at all. Well, I think that comes back to your uh, original comparison of Sony versus Apple. You know that it's it's that added uh, expertise that. IA and UX bring to product development that can, you know, make a company a super company. Right. And I mean, even look at Google right now and, and not that, not that they're failing, but there is this kind of, I think, general perception of them slipping. And it might be that they've gotten to a point where all the great engineers in the world can't get them any further. Mm -hmm. And there's something missing. So it's like they've had this unbelievable advantage over their competition by dint of just fantastic, fantastic engineering firepower. And I don't think they've lost that, but they've lost some opportunities because, you know, engineers are problem solvers, but they can't solve all problems. Right. You have to have an interdisciplinary uh, approach. And I think that's where they're starting to fall down. Yeah. Well, I know my book on Google Wave is just about to come out, and I think <laughs> <laughs> I think that's going to take over. So. Um, so why don't we wrap it up? And and I have a, a final question. You know, this may take a while to answer. Uh, you know, we've talked about UX in terms of web stuff, web sites, but you know, we're really at this kind of changing point. Um, where mobile is now becoming huge. And I think we're really going to see another explosion when these TVs start coming out. You know, when we start getting like the Apple TV and we start accessing the web through our television sets, you know, there's the, is it the Samsung TV that they're now pushing that has this pretty innovative interface and lets you access all this web content. Um, what are your thoughts on, uh, UX, how does it have to evolve and change, or does it for dealing with these new, you know, with mobile and with ultimately with other devices like televisions? Well, I think what we've done is unbelievable work in kind of micro UX 
in, in terms of, you know, the, the kind of nitty gritty of interaction design at, a, right. a, at the interface level. Um, but, you know, now what um, we're really facing is, is the kind of challenges you just described, cross-channel, cross-device, and uh, it becomes really a, a, a challenge in terms of service design. And, um, you know, it, it's funny, I, I signed a book on service design probably over two years ago now, and it's making slow but steady progress, mm -hmm. might get out by the end of the year. All along the way, I, I was kept being worried that we were going to be too late and that the interest will ha would have uh, subsided. And, and I, I'm actually now, I really don't worry about it too much. I think it's <laughs> only going to grow. And it's just, it's kind of, you know, this, this basic challenge of, of coherence and, and uh, cohesiveness. It's pu putting a lot of things together, not just cross-channel, but also cross-device in ways that make sense. So think about, think about it. Um, you, let's say, are frustrated with company X and you've, you've given up on, uh, on you know, trying to get technical support through their, their horrible uh, voice attendance system. And what do you do? You, you, you tweet something and you get the answer within 10 minutes. Right. Mm -hmm. Now, that's a, a sure sign of, of huge imbalance as well as huge internal waste in these companies. And I think they're going to figure that out. Right. And uh, even the most mundane companies like your, your, your cable service provider is, is going to figure that out and they're going to need people. They're going to really need people. And there are huge opportunities for this broader macro level of user experience that the service designers are tackling. So, um, you know, if I had to invest in um, companies, if I had a you know, million dollars to throw into some companies right now, uh, I, I would make them pass some sort of litmus test in terms of their, their service design <laughs> awareness or literacy before I gave them anything. Right. But like, so are you talking about like in terms of, because you mentioned the Twitter example, like, uh, you know, because I have experience where like I couldn't get a hold of Delta via their website, right. phone number or whatever. I just, you know, I did what was really unique to Twitter. I complained on Twitter. <laughs> and, uh, exactly. And, exactly. and, I, and I, got, got I got a response, right? right? And so is it more like uh, customer service where you can't replace the person or do you, and, or do you think they just need to... You know, is a problem that can be fixed with information architecture and UX to, uh, to you know, solve those problems in some sort of contextual is or is you know, is that the right? Well, I mean, I think I mean service design is a discipline that's that's emerging, and it, I think it's got a little bit more oomph on the the, uh, the other side of the Atlantic in, in uh, Western Europe, um, but we're we're starting to really encounter it more uh, in North America. And, uh, and I think, you know, I don't think there, it's a panacea, but I do think there are a bunch of tools and, and, and approaches that service designers use um, to do things like not only align how services can work together as part of a single experience, but to address some of the imbalances that um, you, you see that are primarily channel-based. I mean, there's no, it doesn't make sense that Delta gets back to you through Twitter, but not through this incredible, expensive channel that they've invested in for years and years, namely their website and, uh, or their, you know, their, their phone system or whatever. Right. It doesn't make any sense at all. Mm -hmm. So um, if I'm a manager, a senior decision maker at Delta, I got to be asking myself, why am I spending so much money there when it, it's so inefficient mm -hmm. and, and people are going over to some other place that we're able to service at a fraction of the cost? Right. There, there's some disconnects there, and I'm, I'm not saying you get rid of one channel, but there's probably maybe some alignment or some combinations and some unique and innovative ways where those things start being leveraged together. So I, I think there's some really great opportunities there, and I, I think you know if you, if you define user experience today, and then you could you know, define it again uh, five years, if you define it five years from now and you compare those two definitions, I think the five year from now definition would sound a lot more like this macro approach, this service design approach, uh, than how we define it today. Well, uh, thanks, Lou. It's been great talking to you. Been very informative, and I've certainly learned a lot more about UX. Yeah. Um, so, really appreciate you coming on the show. Oh, it's been a pleasure. I really appreciate the opportunity. A lot of fun. How can people find you on the the Twitters 
or on the Facebooks or whatnot? On the- sure. Um, uh, um, I seem to be everywhere. In fact, I'm at a lot of conferences, and uh, I've been my wife and I've been calling me the conference slut, uh, <laughs> considering how much I, I have to go away these days. But uh, I go to a lot of conferences. Uh, I'm in Twitter, Lewis Rosenfeld. Uh, no space, you know, no no hyphens or anything. Just just one string. Mm-hmm. Uh, Rosenfeld Media, uh, the same uh, is my uh, is our is our publishing company. Um, um, certainly in in Facebook and and uh, there's not a lot of Lewis Rosenfelds out there. <laughs> so um, uh, lewisrosenfeld dot com if you ever want to pop me an email. Awesome. Cool. Well, thank you so much. Thanks, guys. Take care. Our thanks to Lou Rosenfeld for joining us on Non-Breaking Space. You can check out the show notes for this episode at nonbreakingspace.tv, where we'll have all the links discussed in this episode. We're also on Twitter at NBSPTV and on Facebook at the same address. We're also on the iTunes podcast listing, and we'd really appreciate it if you subscribed and left a rating or review. It just helps us spread the word about the Non-Breaking Space show. Be sure to watch for the next episode of the Non-Breaking Space show to hear Nicole Sullivan say, The danger of just taking a... Um, any kind of framework wholesale is that you end up with a product that looks exactly like that framework. Right, right. <laughs> and you don't have a lot of you don't have a lot of um, distinction in, in what right. you've made. So. Talking to you, Twitter bootstrap. Mm-hmm.